one comment. We're not doing away with cars. We're making carbonless vehicles. We will still have transportation. And that's one of the fear points that people use, is that you're not going to be able to fly. You're not going to do electric vehicles. You need to build the infrastructure so people have confidence in electric vehicles. And we need to have a president that doesn't want them. You yeah, sorry, I, did, I did not mean to imply that cars would go away. That was <laughs> not my intention. <laughs> I was simply trying to say that folks that are working in carbon-heavy industries now will be taken care of under this, uh, under this proposal. So um, thank you, Debbie, for helping to uh, make sure that I said the right thing. Well, I just wondered when you talked about that um, uh, company um, uh, doing a lot of business uh, with solar panels, are they paying wages that... Um, Union wages and um, how is that across the, the industry? These new jobs are they keeping up with, um, or are they lower paying than what people are transitioning from? I, I my, my understanding from this, conver this conversation I had is that they pay pretty well. Okay. So um, one thing I'm. Um, Concerned with when it comes down to the Green New Deal is um, making sure that there's like a relationship between the businesses that happen to have individuals that might be like you know replaced by robots because um, of automation and you have these individuals that are being told, okay, um, my job is about to basically expire for the next couple months. Is there like a way or like a network that can be established in order to make sure that those people are? Um, told that uh, their job, like basically get, shepherd them over to another job that they can do in order to like help out this new green deal. Yeah, I think you brought up a really good yeah. point. I mean, as we continue to develop, there's going to be a lot of automation that puts a lot of trades yeah. workers out of work, and that's where the federal jobs guarantee comes in as this additional safety net to tell those workers and provide them with the training for the skills in this new economy. So rather than, um, you know, I can't think of an example right off the top of my head, but if they're in a skilled trade right now that gets replaced by autom automation, we, the federal government would then provide training programs for them to work in a green economy, building green technologies. And will this be like seamless where individuals just like, you know, they're told immediately that they have this job or this opportunity to train like immediately? Right, and the, the details of that are all going to have to be worked out by policymakers in Washington. The Green New Deal resolution that's on the table right now is a non-binding resolution to start the process of designing those laws. Ideally, it would be as seamless as possible and most efficient as possible, um, um, but we don't know exactly how that would look like. But when we talk about why we support a Green New Deal, we support a Green New Deal that focuses on that efficiency. Um, anything that would not work, it would not be part of the Green New Deal that we want to support. And my um, second question, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. So, the cars that, for instance, run on electricity, there might be an issue with that even when you consider the fact that most of the parts that are manufactured require um, emissions as well. So, is there like a way or are there any like discussions being put towards yeah. the possibility of... Um, well, part of it is we do need to, cars will always be a part of this country, but we do need to shift away from single occupancy vehicles and focus on mass transit and developing that infrastructure and encouraging people to use public transit by making it cheap and by making it fast and efficient. Um, you're exactly right. What's the good of a electric car if you plug it into a power plant that uses coal, right. exactly? Um, so that's why it's an entire economic decarbonization. We need to look at every sector, the energy sector, the transportation sector, agriculture, the way we eat food. Everything needs to be looked at. And again, those individual policies are being worked out by policymakers. Uh, there will be a lot of debate over that. Um, but in general, we have to look at everything together and how it uh, interconnects. Thank you. Oh, man, there's so many people. I don't know. Two policy questions. Is there any questions for Yusuf before he gets yes. out? Okay. <laughs> I have two questions for you. Uh, the Republican-controlled legislature blocked Tesla from selling electric cars in Michigan. I'm curious if you got anything to say about that. We, we have, they sell directly. You had to go over the state line to buy one. And in Michigan, there's no, this was odd to me, growing up in Maryland, there was an emissions inspection. 
which drove a lot of small businesses, a lot of jobs into a little uh, service base where you would get your car inspected every year for emissions. And that apparently not something we can do in Michigan either. These are two national level and local level job creation sources that it seems like the Republican controlled legislature doesn't allow. Why are we strangling ourselves on these things that are good for the economy, good for the environment? What's the, what's the strategy? Uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, I think that speaks to a broader issue of our political environment, right? And so some of these bills that we're, you know, thinking about pushing forward at the state level are going to run into some of that partisan resistance. I do think that there are some things that we can, uh, that we can work with the Republicans on. We're actually seeing a lot more bipartisanship in Lansing this time because Thankfully, we've elected some amazing women to help uh, run the show, uh, and so they are uh, doing very powerful work to ensure that uh, our friends on the other side of the aisle are continuing to work with us throughout that process. So I think we have more opportunities this time uh, than we have before. Um, Do you see a policy or a structure that will allow stuff like letting an electric car be sold directly in the state? Yeah, I mean, so so that gets to an issue of basically uh, franchise laws for dealerships in Michigan, um, which is a bigger issue that, you know, impacts um, the entire market for how we sell cars. Uh, and so basically, in a nutshell, uh, Tesla doesn't have the same model of selling vehicles that we allow in Michigan. So we have current franchise laws that allow vehicles to be sold a certain ways through dealerships. And it allows for um, for our dealers to uh, yeah to, to have certain it, it creates certain regulations on the dealer's relationship with the manufacturers. But Tesla's model is that they want they like to direct sell from the company. They don't like to have dealers basically do the selling. Um, and our franchise laws don't allow that. And so the issue Tesla wants to change the law so that they can direct sell. Um, but the you know the the current dealer system and. I think the current manufacturers are not too keen on that um, changing, so so that's really the that's really the the, the, the problem. It's not an issue of electric vehicles. Um, electric vehicles can be sold in Michigan. It's an issue of Tesla's model of direct sale. That's really the issue. So, Rita, um, can you talk about DTE's influence, DTE and, and Yeah, this is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we've had some challenges with some of our utilities and how they've uh, treated the solar industry, uh, particularly home solar and the ability of individuals to generate their own power. Like I was saying earlier, we have a great state where people are really interested in generating their own electricity. Uh, but in the 2016 energy bill, um, there was built in uh, a small phrase that basically allowed for the creation of what was called the distributed generation grid tariff. Uh, and that was interpreted by the Michigan Public Service Commission to mean uh, a broader array, array of things than was initially anticipated in the negotiations for the 2016 law. What they've been able to do is before, uh, if any of you have a solar panel as of June of 2018, you are in a net metering system, which means that if you generate uh, 80 units of energy and you use 100 units of energy, you only have to buy 20 units of energy from the grid. But they've now used this one phrase in the new energy law to allow basically DTE, the MPSC, DTE and consumers have changed the law so that now if you install a solar panel after June 2018, you are in what's called an inflow outflow system, which means you have to sell your 80 units of energy to the grid at wholesale price, so the price that they pay for large producers like natural gas plants and stuff like that, so it's really low rate, and you have to buy all 100 units of energy at retail rate, which is what they charge uh, all consumers. So you are uh, basically eliminating the advantage of having solar panels, and they're discounting the fact that you're using your own energy that you're producing. So that's number one. Number two, they're also creating this tariff, this uh, grid connection fee that makes it so that if you hook up to the grid, if you have a solar panel, you have to pay monthly for the privilege of still being on the grid. Um, so in addition to this inflow outflow disadvantage, they're also going to be charging a monthly fee. That monthly fee, we were expecting that that would be all they did. Um, and so that fee was supposed to, they were supposed to sit down and look at the pros and cons of having solar. 
uh, and determine a fair price per month that people would pay. Uh, because there are certain costs of, of, of maintaining the grid uh, that energy companies do have to bear. <clears throat> and so there is a fair way of determining what a cost could be. Um, but they did not take into account things like the fact that if Rita is generating sol solar energy on her house, that energy is not going downtown Detroit and then getting redistributed in southeast Michigan. That energy is being used by her neighbors. So you've reduced the burden on the grid by having those distributed generation panels. So it really should not be uh, heavily skewed against solar, uh, solar uh, producers. So, and DTE is actively in a rate case right now to increase that grid tariff uh, and make it even more, uh, more barriers basically for folks that want to put solar panels. DT is also apparently, I just found out, trying to reduce the amount that they would reimburse uh, for hydropower. So Ann Arbor has two hydropower dams. The people of Ann Arbor get to uh, recoup some of the uh, you know, energy that we generate on the Huron River by selling it to DTE, while DTE is saying we want to jack, we, 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 we want to uh, reduce the amount that we compensate the city for that, all, that renewable energy that's being generated. So they're doing all kinds of things that I'm very disappointed with uh, to actually disincentivize the use of uh, alternative energy. Um, and so I continue to uh, work on those issues and um, hopefully we can get some changes. One of the positives is that the MPS, the governor just appointed Dan Scripps to the MPSC. Dan is awesome. He has worked in alternative energy uh, uh, for a good chunk of his career, former state representative. Uh, from a district that has since gone pretty far in the red direction. Um, so we, there, we're making some progress there, and there's another MPSC appointment coming up um, in the summer. So, Janet? What is the oversight of DTE and consumers? I, I am yeah. from out of, out of the country. So Michigan, Michigan has a, a regulated utility market. There's, there's a few different types of utilities. Uh, you can have a municipal utility like Lansing and Holland where the people of that city own the utility. Uh, that's my favorite model. Um, so, and then uh, there's also a cooperative. You can have an energy cooperative. Many of our rural areas in northern Michigan are covered by energy co-ops. Uh, and so that's another model for energy. But the vast majority of our citizens in Michigan are covered under uh, basically these corporations, private, privately held corporations, but they're publicly regulated utilities. And there's something called the M Michigan Public Service Commission that oversees their activities, sets their uh, rates, sets their ability to charge these fees to solar users, uh, determines what their profits are going to be able to be. They can't make over a certain amount. Uh, but it also means that they usually don't make under a certain amount, so they have sort of guaranteed profits in many ways uh, that are built into our rate structure of what we pay. Um, so, yeah. Is that the point of pressure that would be applied? Is that the Public Service Commission? Yeah, they, they are the oversight, the three-member oversight board. So if the right people are appointed to that, then yes, absolutely, that will change. They're the ones that made these decisions on the grid tariff, on the distributed generation, inflow outflow system they're the ones that made all those decisions it was not technically the utilities it was through their pressure that it ultimately happened but yeah. it ultimately wasn't their decision yeah who makes those decisions who's on that so there's three members of the MPSC appointed by the governor uh, on a rotating basis so all of the members on there were Schneider appointees when these decisions were made the pending decisions that are up now will be made by the three-member board. One of them is now a Whitmer appointee, and this summer there will be another Whitmer appointee um, on there. So we need to call your uh, governor's office and make sure that she knows that uh, you're interested in having somebody on there that um, has the interests of the alternative energy uh, market distributed generation in, in their mind. So. For me? Yes, for you. I'm sorry. I have a few more minutes. You're good. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, what are the areas where you feel you can work together across? You know, you mentioned that there were a number of areas. Yeah. Like well, this is getting a little bit off the track of the Green New Deal, but I'll just briefly mention that one, one of the big areas is criminal justice reform. I saw Jeff Irwin here earlier. I don't know. He might have stepped out of the room, but him and I have been working really closely in this area, but uh, things around... Uh, changing the civil asset forfeiture laws, uh, um, 
changing the laws around expungement in the state of Michigan, making it easier for people to get their records expunged. Uh, so we have, there's a lot of work that we're, that we're doing right now um, on the criminal justice reform front, and the Republicans are really active in helping with all of that. So, and we're trying to bring the prosecuting attorneys to the table and the defense attorneys to the table in all these discussions, so I think a lot of those uh, different parties have been included, which is, it's cool to see that, you know, we're, we're making sure that all the voices are at the table. Satish? So, uh, there, are, there are several misinformation about the Green New Deal. Uh, can you speak to some of the top one and what part of the Green New Deal are fanning those misinformation? Can you speak to that a little bit? What part of the Green New Deal is spreading Fan the misinformation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe you well, can just tell what are those top one, and I think a lot of us know. Yeah. Yusuf talked a little about, about the, the environmentalism is seen as anti-jobs. That's why we're trying to make our focus jobs, but that hasn't stopped the Republicans and the opposition, even within the Democratic Party, from making it a job issue. Um, the federal jobs guarantee pretty much lays out that we are pro-jobs. Um, but in addition, I haven't mentioned yet, those jobs, we want those to be union jobs to work with local existing unions and for those jobs to be democratically controlled by the local areas from which they, they come from. We don't want the federal government telling all these people all over the country what they have to do. Okay, you have to work here, you have to work here. We want it to be a democratic process in which we can work with communities to figure out what is best for them um, while at that same time providing that safety blanket of the federal jobs guarantee. The Germans had been researching the development of hydrogen for powering vehicles. I don't know what has become of that. But um, second, uh, I was just reading yesterday about two fellows in Switzerland that have put three to four million dollars into drawing hydrocarbons out of the atmosphere. I mean, they've got like 18 huge fans that draw it in and they're creating CO2 that they're storing in underground tanks for fertilizer for farmers and uh, for beverage companies. So I don't know if you'd heard anything about that. Yeah, uh, carbon sequestration um, and hydrogen, are, the problems, they're great technologies, the problems is that they're too expensive. Yeah, and, um, and it, it'd be great to continue research and we need to continue research. Um, but the one misunderstanding about renewable energy is that we have to that we're going to be saved by some sort of technological revolution that's going to come in the next 20 years. We have the technology right now to transform our economy to 100% renewable energy by 2050. Right now, we don't have to develop anything new. We just have to put the money into it and get the people on the ground building that, that infrastructure. Can I, can I build off of that really quick? Uh, I'm sorry, I just scared everybody. They moved the mic. I should never do that. Don't touch the mic. Lesson for the day. Um, all right, so uh, my, I just wanted to build off of what, what Hudson just said, too. Uh, you know, my, my grandpa worked in the auto industry, um, and my father works in the auto industry, and my mom worked in the auto industry for a little while. Um, it's an important industry and there are a lot of very 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 smart people that work in the auto industry at all levels that are doing really important work and uh, that's there is so much creativity and ingenuity that can come out of that um, and we have the technology now to do it by 2050 but the challenge is can we do it sooner than that and, can, and, and we have I think the talent right here in Michigan working for the big three auto manufacturers and all the tier one tier two tier three uh, part suppliers that are that if unleashed to, to, to do this kind of work, I think that has incredible capacity to accelerate that timeline to be able to get some of this stuff done before 2050. Um, and, and because, you know, like Debbie was saying, nobody's, we're not trying to say we're not going to use cars. We're, we're going to be using cars. Uh, cars are going to be, they have been part of our economy for generations. They will be part of our economy in the future. But that's why we have so much potential here in Michigan. We have the talent and the brain power to be able to, to do this. And sometimes it just takes um, creating the right regulatory environment to encourage our auto manufacturers to invest the resources they need and to unleash their talent towards those uh, goals and opportunities that, that can really make a difference. When the Obama administration made some of those changes uh, you know, to the fuel economy standards, the, the manufacturers, you know, whether they liked it or not, they, they ultimately got to work. They went to the drawing board, they had their you know, engineers and folks working on this kind of stuff, and that's the creative potential that can be unleashed when we you know, create this sort of environment where this is our goal, we need to get here, we have the talent to do it. So.
Oh, Debbie wants to add to that. that. First of all, I think that you know, we were back here and he was asking the question, what are some of the, so people are saying that you can't, the new Green Deal, would uh, you wouldn't be able to fly. So, you know, they challenged the senator from Hawaii, how would she get there? One of the, and when you talk about um, the utility industry, here's the reality. When you talk about renewable sources, everybody thought wind was going to be expensive, solar. The cost to the utilities of wind and natural resources is lower than anybody thought. So that's low. When it comes to electric vehicles, and I'm working with AOC on this, and I have invited AOC to Washington, and I believe she will come. So um, stay tuned. But I, I went to... The problem is we got two problems. You got autonomous vehicles and you've got electric vehicles. The consumer confidence in autonomous vehicles has gone down, not up, in the last year. Nobody trusts them. People don't. On electric vehicles, you know, I, and I went to AOC the first day she was there and said, "Okay, if we're going to do this, we got to get electric vehicles. To get to a carbonless society, you have to have electric vehicles because <laughs> there, we don't have the." It, we don't have the infrastructure to support it. And the technology is expensive right now. We're working on a deal right now that will just raise the tax credit. You know, right now we underwrite the cost of every electric vehicle that's there. General Motors is investing heavily in electric vehicles. I don't trust General Motors on anything, and I'm not their favorite person. But they are investing. I shouldn't have said that. But, um, and Ford Motor is. It, but they are, so they're investing in these electric vehicles. But we have to build the electric, the infrastructure yes. to support it. And the other thing is going to take consumer, right now you're used to running into a gas station and, you know, refueling in five minutes. It takes half an hour right now to recharge that vehicle. And people don't have the outlets in their garage. I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, how can we get the housing industry to install the proper, you know, it's going to take one fire in somebody's garage on charging an electric vehicle that's going to make consumer confidence in EVs go the way of autonomy. Which is why we need well-trained IBW members and so Correct, though. <laughs> so we got to, there, there, the technology's there. It's, you know, we can all have theoretical discussions. One, we got to make them affordable, which is part of the yeah. problem. And two, we got to build consumer confidence because companies need the dollars. You know, when I said this in committee this week, that China's just mandated they're going to electric vehicles. Right. And that we, as a country, are going to compete in a global marketplace. So if we are going to compete, China's <coughs> mandating electric vehicles, India's mandating electric vehicles, Western Europe is building these autonomous vehicles. If we're going to compete in a global marketplace, we have to do it. Which was why it doesn't help to have a president of the United States that's making fun of this innovation and technology, and yet he says that he wants us to stay at the forefront of it. So there are issues, of in, especially in terms of having the money to invest in the R&D, changing consumer psychology, and making sure we have the infrastructure to support it, which we don't right now. And people are worried about range. Range on a battery right now is 150 miles. We need to be investing in that battery research to get the range larger and build the infrastructure. This is my... I want to address one more concern about the Green New Deal. Everyone always says, how are you going to pay for it? Um, I'm sure someone has that question. Well, the same way we I'm paid... Ask it, man. <laughs> the, we're going to pay for it the same way we paid for World War II, the same way we paid for the Persian Gulf War, the same way we paid for the Iraq War, the same way we paid for the bank bailouts after the financial crisis. Congress is going to authorize the expenses, and the Treasury is going to spend the money. This is a crisis like we have not seen since World War II. It is the fate of humanity. It's the fate of <laughs> the way we live. Um, and it's going to disproportionately affect poor people around the world, people of color in the global south. Um, so we can pay for it. Um, we've spent, I, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's available online. Just look up how much we've spent since 2001. <laughs> In Iraq and Afghanistan, it has added, not, it has not contributed to inflation, and that is all deficit spending. That is all um, deficit spending. So, so we can pay for it. Lots of questions. Hudson's calling on people. <laughs> what have you um, Doug, <clears throat> following on Debbie's comment about the president. So, if we reduce this to the absolutely simplest form, okay, absolutely simplest form, if Mitch McConnell stays in power, Donald Trump stays in power the Michigan House stays Republican, and the Michigan Senate stays Republican, none of this happens. Yep. Zero. 
Correct. That's why we got to organize. <laughs> we can talk theoretically, but none of this happens. I would tell you that electric vehicles, we got to figure out how we can make them affordable. But I think people are starting to work on that recognize the need for the infrastructure. And just like the call, now I'm not, I learned more from Yusuf today about what they're doing in terms of the grid, et cetera. But like, all the, both utility companies in Michigan are eliminating coal burning uh, plants. They've accelerated the closing of the Trenton coal power plant. They've accelerated the River Rouge plant. Uh, River Rouge will stay open a year longer, but they'll both close in. And I think, Yusuf, they're closing every coal power plant in the state by 20... That's what they've announced. 20. I don't remember the year, but yeah. Yeah, so some of it's happening. It, I mean, I know the, down, the plants in my area are like closed in 2020. So... In the back. Uh, just a couple of things. You, know, you were talking about the plants, coal plants. Germany, I think they're doing that because Germany, you know, wheat has 12 coal, coal power plants. And they power a lot of Europe. Germany decided that they would shut down all their plants by 2024. So I think they're doing it. And Germany said, we're not using coal anymore. And I just wanted to say something. I think what people don't realize, my son has um, just got his degree. He's getting ready to go to grad school. He's thinking MIT. But one of the big things that he found out was offered at schools, but it's been offered for a few years, and, I, and it's started right here in Michigan, and we don't know. As part of this engineering program, there are classes on developing um, fuel cell batteries and yeah. stuff. And, and it's really interesting. Eastern has these classes. U of M has these classes. Um, Washington is looking into doing some of these classes. And I, I thought that was just really interesting that people say, oh, well, we're not ready, we're not ready. But it's like they've already started. And I think these classes have been offered at the university for like a while. And my husband's an engineer. And he works for a, I think it's a Korean company. And their technology, he's working on, not supposed to talk about it, but they're working because <laughs> he always says, don't read that. Off. But, <laughs> but they're doing these fuel cell batteries yeah. that go in foreign cars. And he just always, and he works at home two days a week. And he goes, This is just so fucking stupid. I'm like, What? He's like, We could do this. And I'm like, Well, so, that's, yeah. Exactly. You know, and he's, and that's what he does. And he does different batteries, designs, and the way they fit into cars and stuff. And there, and my thing is, if they're already doing that in other countries, why aren't we doing the right. same thing? Because it's already there. Really, it's because of the way that our politicians think in terms of economic theory. Uh, we've ever since what about your politicians? Well? <laughs> <laughs> not my politicians. Not my politicians. <laughs> not my politicians. <laughs> Don't throw us all under the bus. <laughs> yeah. Well, politicians in general. We've, ever since this Reagan era, well, even within the Democratic Party, we've been really, really hesitant to intervene to correct for market deficiencies. Europe has not had that. No. It, it, we really have not gone. We, we need to return to this New Deal era style politics in which Republicans and Democrats al alike thought that we needed to correct market deficiencies, um, to create government <coughs> programs, to provide jobs, to steer the market in the right direction. <coughs> We haven't really had that to the extent that we saw in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s since the Reagan era.